Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I wanted to give a shout out to Mike Jansen. Mike Jansen, for those of you that don't know, he is the um, in-stadium announcer for the Indianapolis Colts NFL football team here in the United States. Um, but he is also even more famous for creating out of the kindness of my heart my intro and my outro. The intro and outro that you see every day Mike Jansen did them, and he was one of my—he was one of the first people that ever uh, emailed me or direct messaged me and said, "Hey, man, I think that you're onto something. I think you're going to get a lot of subscribers." And so he's been a very helpful and nice person from day one, and I appreciate it. And I think, and he, by the way, he also has a, a video production company and does video production. If that's ever something you're interested in, he's got a website, mgjansen.com. You can also give him a follow on, tit, on uh, Twitter. I almost said a bad word on accident. Mike Jensen, it's at Colts Stadium PA. And um, just a really good guy and, and has really... Um, helped me a lot um, from day one for no reason than just to be nice and I appreciate it okay moving along let me show you something I was literally sitting in the McDonald's drive-thru because as you know my eight-year-old does not let me have a Friday without telling me I've got to go to McDonald's to get him he he likes pancakes and sausage he also likes to order me to cut it up for him um, while he lounges in his chair and watches his iPad and then I serve it to him this kid is the baby and he is spoiled rotten um, so and he always takes his mother's side by the way always he'll throw me under the bus in a second this kid okay but while I was in the drive thru I, I ran across this this morning and it just I'll be honest it just pissed me off these people, and remember what you need to understand, Timothy Geithner, Hank Paulson, and, and I don't think Ben Bernanke's on this stage, but he, those three guys are the guys that more or less were in charge of, uh, were, they were supposedly what got us out of the financial crisis. What they really did is bailed out all their buddies. And, and I know people in my town who were bailed out who to this day never did get a scarlet letter like some of the people that were not bailed out got and and walk around like they're leaders in the community now and they were nothing they were they were nothing but too big to fail or big enough to have friends in high places and got bailed out and it's disgusting it was one of the it in my opinion it's the one of the worst things that's ever been done in the history of finance they opened up they 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 took the genie out of the bottle on socialism and and have have made it a huge part of this country and the countries of the world now because of what they did and I want you to hear this this right here is is um is uh, Sheryl Sandberg Hank Paulson Bob Rubin and Tim Geithner and what I want you to get out of this is the dirty little secret that I that I say here these people these powerful people they come up with all these buzzwords that they know they can sell to people to pull people's heartstrings in this case one of their buzzwords is income inequality they use these to make you think they give two you know what's about you and me and they don't here's what they really think listen to this so in income inequality this is something I think we've all thought about you know I was working on that topic when I was still at Goldman Sachs and uh, and uh, in which direction oh, you're working on increasing it yeah yeah thank you why the, but, but, but yeah think, yeah and then we come out here and we pretend to you that, that we care about it <laughs> but we let they, they got caught in a little moment of telling you the truth right there just disgusting makes me sick to see stuff like that because I know what really went on okay crypto uh, coin market cap um, we're at 2.5 trillion folks I mean 
we're at 2.5 trillion i don't think this is happening i think 2.5 trillion is the highest i've ever seen it on here and it's headed for 2.6 trillion we've got ourselves an xrp that started surging this morning we had a monster green candle then there was a little bit of a pullback but i see the green candle going right back up i believe that tonight might be an interesting night for xrp i really do let me show you what some people, this is my thought right here. XRP is scratching and clawing for that all time high. Run XRP, run. One of my favorite movies, Forrest Gump. And then the Joker, Crypto Joker 12, he said it's happening. And he's pointing at XLM, XRP, and I think he's a big Digibyte fan. Um, then Crypto Bull, his thread's interesting. He, he's retweeting somebody that sa says XRP $2.50, let's go. Then he says, see you above $2. And then he gives you a kaboom. I like the sound of all of that. And then let's see, this, this was going around today um, a lot this morning. And, and I haven't, I, I just saw um, Coining203 tweet this. And so I just wanted to show it to you. Wait, so where, so where did 10 billion XRP go? The circulating supply has dropped from 45 to 35. And you can see it here. If you look right here, um, it's now 35, the circulating supply, and it was 45. We got all these people in XRP land that, that are paying attention to all this. Okay, then we had, of course, CNBC this morning is talking about Dogecoin because it's just such, it's the future of finance. They just have to talk about Dogecoin, right? I want to talk more about Dogecoin. It keeps climbing. The meme-inspired cryptocurrency nearing, nearly doubling over the past week alone. This ahead of Elon Musk's appearance on SNL this weekend. Kate Rooney joins us with more. Good to see you this morning, Kate. Hey, Andrew. Good morning. Great to see you. Elon Musk has been a pretty public fan of Dogecoin since at least last year, but he's been stepping up those cryptocurrency mentions recently as its price surges. The Tesla CEO called it, quote, the people's crypto back in February. That was when Dogecoin was trading around five cents. Then in April, he tweeted about SpaceX putting a, quote, literal Dogecoin on the moon. When Musk announced- Okay, that's enough of that mess. Anyway, he's going on SNL. I will warn any of you that, that have bought into all this Doge stuff, I will tell you just this, okay? I will, I'm, I will not be owning Doge coin, okay? But I'll tell you this, my ex, this is just purely my experience in crypto. My experience in crypto is anytime you see a massive build up to one particular piece of news or one particular event, the result is the exact opposite of what the speculation was. It's happened in XRP a thousand times. So when everybody and their brother and sister are getting excited about Elon Musk talking about Dogecoin on SNL, my gut immediately tells me that there's a dump inbound instead of what everybody's anticipating is some spike, especially against the backdrop of all the spikes they've had so far that were based on nothing. Okay, but also I made another point. I said Doge, Dogecoin is about to jump the shark. Look it up, young people. And they, they were featured on on um, on Bloomberg TV as well. This is what jumped the shark. It's a reference. There, there was a, a show when I was a kid called Happy Days, and the Fonz was the cool guy with the leather jacket on Happy Days. And the reference jumping the shark came when the show had been around so long. They did an episode where he. It with his leather jacket on, puts a pair of skis on, gets in the water, and there's a shark that he literally jumps over. And it was an indication that the show had run its course. <laughs> and I think, the, and it, it was a TV type reference, but I think that the same's applicable for Dogecoin. I think we're about to jump the shark uh, very soon, and I would not want to be holding it when that happens. Now, the SEC chairman was on CNBC today and this and and so and think about this this is how ridiculous our world has gotten now so the sec chairman of the united states is on cnbc we have the most important case in financial history in front of the chairman sec versus ripple and all andrew ross sorkin can think to ask about is dogecoin boy we live in one upside down paris hilton pop culture bs world and i stand by those statements because i am dead 1000 percent right about this that is pitiful 
Um, they, they should pull this guy's journalism card for not asking this guy about the SEC versus Ripple case, but talking about Dogecoin. It's ridiculous. He ought to be embarrassed. CNBC ought to be embarrassed. And even the, the SEC chairman should be embarrassed. Um, I'll leave you with this. Are you going to be watching Saturday Night Live on Saturday night? And if so, do you, do you have a message for, for Mr. Musk? <laughs> I don't know whether I'll be watching Saturday Night Live, but he said he should have said, "You idiot, ask me about XRP and the and the SEC versus Ripple case to save just a little bit of face there." All right, and here's more commentary from the SEC chairman. How do you think of the role of social media? I mean, this goes back to GameStop, but also you're seeing it in crypto. Um, Elon Musk is going to be on SNL this weekend. Uh, we've watched Dogecoin uh, nearly double over the week as people speculate that he's going to do a segment or a, a, a skit around that. Uh, he's been on Twitter talking about these things. What do you think of the ce celebrities taking to Twitter? Um, you know, we're looking at a tweet right now. Let's find out how just how live Saturday Night Live really is. Um, and literally just on the backs of the, these kinds of communications, you're seeing uh, stocks move. You're seeing crypto move. What, when, when you think about investor protection, what do you do about that, if anything? So, so I think that uh, we've lived, every, every decade we get new technologies. There were debates uh, 100 years ago whether to allow a telephone on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And here we're in the 2020s. We, we need to update and freshen our rules to ensure that while retail investors and any individual has a First Amendment rights to speak and so forth, that they're not uh, misleading the public. They're not manipulating the public, manipulating the markets. In the securities field, we have a lot of authorities to do that. In a number of these crypto fields, not so clear if it's Bitcoin, for instance, which has uh, been deemed not to be a security. But I do think that we're going to be freshening up our rules and really hearing from the public. Um, I think that uh, the community and the social media is good. But let's recognize also that now computers can train on that social media, do something which is called sentiment analysis. This is computers watching our words. In fact, this interview right now probably is being interpreted in sentiment analysis, meaning a computer somewhere is taking Anders and my words and saying, what does it mean for the markets? Now, the stock market's not yet open, but what does it mean for the markets? Okay, I think that's the, and there he said, uh, been deemed not to be a security. Right, so he said Bitcoin's not a secure, has been deemed, it actually has not been deemed. In fact, the SEC documents in the lawsuit, one of the SEC officials uh, said clearly that uh, that they had not decided one way or the, or the other. Now, he has the power right now to say that's the, and I guess he just said that the, the official SEC position is that Bitcoin's not a security. I'm, I'm assuming that that's what that means, but until now, but 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 what that means is they also have to have documentation for the lawsuit. Now, many people think that him saying Bitcoin is not a um, security is the most is the biggest clip out of that clip right there. I do not believe that at all. I believe the scariest and and creepiest part of that clip right there is when he says we're going to freshen up our rules and then references the first amendment when i hear a government official talking about freshening up rules and then gives the caveat oh yeah you do have first amendment rights but if you're misleading the public see this is the thing even though i disagree with if i mean i i think what elon musk is doing is is not is I, I wouldn't be doing it, sending people off, leaving this impression that Dogecoin is something that's okay. I wouldn't be doing that. But I think Elon Musk has every right to, to do it. Now, now, if Elon Musk was doing some pump and dump and he's buying Dogecoin and then dumping it after he makes these comments, that's different. But I believe he has every right to say what he's saying under the First Amendment. And But, but when I start hearing freshening up our rules and then a reverence to the First Amendment, that sounds downright, downright creepy because at, when, when you start looking at the First Amendment like that, 
then so, there, then there there has to be some decider of what's misleading. Just like a, you, you have to have a decider of of what's offensive and what's not. Anytime you go down these kinds of roads, um, that that gets very dangerous. And and you could look up one day and not have your First Amendment. So that's the creepiest thing I heard in that little commentary by far. Now, um, if this, I just did an, an if Squawk Box actually practiced journalism, here's what they would have asked. This is what I would have asked Chairman Gensler. Chairman Gensler, how is it protecting, your number one job is protecting investors. You said it. How is it protecting investors for the SEC to go eight years leading XRP holders to believe that, it well, it must be okay because you aren't doing anything about it. You aren't enforcing the laws. But eight years later, you file a suit. And then you cause $15 billion of, of losses for the XRP holders who sold out of fear when that SEC lawsuit came down. That right there is the question that should have been asked, not about freaking Dogecoin and, and this pile of dog crap coin that they keep talking about. Not that. that this is what's important. I mean, they, they do have an adult audience, don't they? I mean, it's crazy. Now, let's look at something you need to see. Remember, I showed you this in the last video, this last part. Gary uh, Gensler is talking. Gary Gensler is talking about um, how he wants he he defers to Michael Dodson, right? I think that was his name. Um, and then, what the role of the SEC would be is to ensure that whatever rules they're proposing has the resiliency and the important. Uh, safety of a clearinghouse because this is a systemically important clearinghouse. It's the largest, it's really the sole clearinghouse for equities. But I turn to Mr. Bodson. Mr. Bodson's what I meant to say. So anyway, in that in that vein, last in my last video, I did a video on the DTCC, and I and I made and I was talking here that it. I think. He's, he defers back to Michael Bods, Bodson, and then I said, this has always been about all the money, DTCC derivatives. And th what I've got a screenshot of here, this is Ripple's first general counsel, or one of the first, Norman Reed from January 2015 to 2017. Look at his resume. It's quite, quite a set of coincidences that he came from the DTCC to Ripple. And before that, where was he? The SEC, and before that, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Of course, these are all coincidences, so there's nothing to see here. Okay, right? Now, I wanted to show you this clip. This is, um, let me see, this is the final thing I wanted you to see in this Gary Gensler. There's so many clips, but I want you to, I'll start from right here because I don't want you to watch, sit through the whole thing, but listen to what he says. This climate thing, I've been telling you, this climate thing is not coming out of nowhere. It's a narrative, and all these people are the same people. This is on our mobile apps, uh, not just in finance. It, that's, that's generally been a positive outcome. But to guard against that we don't lull ourselves into a place that we're not protecting investors and we're not ensuring for that market integrity that I mentioned earlier. So I think it's... It's good working with the staff and my fellow commissioners to get ahead of that. I also think disclosure, that we're in a new um, decade and investors want to understand more information about uh, climate risk and human capital uh, and, and, and the drivers of value inside of the business. Climate risk and human capital. That reminds me of a couple of things. One is Kevin O'Leary talking about the um, committees on, at all these companies that are going to be looking at things like uh, Bitcoin through the prism of how it affects the climate and energy and all that. Um, I can't, I can't, investor committees, I can't remember what he called them. But anyway, it also reminds me of a tweet from Ripple y yesterday about the crypto climate accord and achieving sustainability. And I showed you that how many times sustainability was being used by all the powers that be right now. Words mean things, narratives mean things, and all of this stuff did not come out of nowhere. And I am not misleading you because I've been following this for years now. This right here is Real Deal Holyfield. 
the you can you can see it a mile away what these what these narratives are I'm the digital asset investor I'm not an investment advisor this is for entertainment purposes only please subscribe hit the like button and tell your friends and family that crypto climate accord and climate regarding finance and crypto seems to be a huge part of 